Craig Stevens, and I'm the president of Westmoreland Heights Neighborhood Association and the founder of that uh, association. We've been around for 33 years. It's a long time. And uh, I grew up here in West Dallas, so I've seen all the changes and things that's taking place here. So I would like to first welcome our panel for uh, coming out and giving us some good, bringing us some good information tonight. And I want to especially thank the community for being here tonight and so we can receive this good information that will be helpful for all of us down through the years. So once again, welcome on behalf of the Women's uh, Voters League, West Nolan Heights, and uh, Let Better Garden. Thank you.
Um, there, there is a housekeeping. I did not pay attention to where the restrooms are, but I'm sure they're out that door. <laughs> Straight down the hall and to the left? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. You have very brief bio information on our speakers in the flyer that is at your, uh, that was on the entry table. Um, and I, so I will begin now with our program. Um, the first speaker that we have is Davidi Mugera, and I always mispronounce your name, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cecilia tried to teach me how to say Mugera today, and I still I don't get it. Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> He is the director of the housing department for the city of Dallas. And um, we are delighted to have him here to talk about the housing policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for having me here today. Where's the computer? What's this? Um, your assistant. Yeah. <laughs> I got in trouble earlier this morning because I didn't. I didn't come prepared for the flash drive. So um, I just had to talk for my for my notes. Thank you. Thank you. If we can uh, share something. Again, I'm, I'm David Nogueira. I'm the uh, Director of Housing with the uh, City of Dallas. And um, I've been in that position now about uh, a year and a half or so. And um, Susan Bell had asked me to come out today and share with you um, an overview of the housing policy that the city recently adopted, um, and particularly to address some of the impacts that, that the housing policy is having on uh, issues of gentrification. So let, let, me, let me first tell you a little about, a bit about what this housing policy is and, and, and is not. Um, the, the housing policy serves as a, a clearinghouse for um, programs, uh, goals, and uh, development priorities. And I, I will tell you there has been debate about um, whether the goals, priorities, and, um, and, and, and programs that we've outlined in housing <coughs> policy are appropriate for the city at this time. Um, I think that the debate has been healthy because um, it gives folks an opportunity to really examine what's going on, right? Now they have a, a, a focus point to, to address their, their attention and, um, and, and concern on, on housing issues. We didn't, we didn't have that um, prior, prior to this housing. So um, I see this as a work in progress, and I hope that over time we can flush it out and, and refine it to further address some of the housing needs. With that said, let me sort of give, give you a little um, bit of a background on, on, on what it is and sort of how we got to this housing policy. So the first thing that I wanted to, to point out was um, the problem, right? And what we identified as the problem through the housing policy was a need for housing units, right? There was clearly a shortage of housing units, and we estimated that to be about 20,000 units. Um, as a result of having uh, this shortage, it impacted the cost of housing, because those units that are available in the marketplace uh, are now higher than, uh, than, than they otherwise would be because of the shortage. So you have uh, folks spending more money on housing costs. And for those folks who are at the lower end of the income spectrum, they're particularly feeling uh, that, that financial burden. We established this, this, um, this, this slide here just to kind of convey this point of um, cost burdening. And if I can talk. We'll, we'll walk you through it. Right? So when we did, when we talk about cost burdening, we're usually referring to people who are spending more than 30% of their income on housing costs. Right? 
when um, things are in line, right, and when you're spending 30% or less, you'll see that you typically have, typically, before Sandy jumps over, typically, <laughs> have um, funds available to pay for the other aspects of your life, be it transportation, child care, food, education, or, or, or health care. One of the challenges that we run into when you start, when families start to spend more than that 30% on housing is that things start to fall off, right? And it's often critical things, you know, so the, the, the family may keep the car because they've got to get back and forth to work, right? They've got to get the kid in, da in daycare because they can't go to work without that, and they've got to eat. So what falls off? Health care, right? And, and you don't think about that till something happens and, and, and you really need it. Education, one of those things, it's going to help you to, 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 to further advance your career, but you keep putting it off, keep putting it off, because it's, it's, it's just not within the budget, right? So, so then when we talk about the goals overcoming generations of, of, of poverty, when you have situations like this, it kind of um, keeps families in that, um, in that position where, where, where they can't uh, further advance themselves financially because they're always playing catch up. So the, the, the housing policy as it was written was um, based on three primary goals, right? The first of which we discussed is the creation and maintenance of housing units. We talked about the 20,000 housing units. And, and again, that's through new development and through the rehabilitation of existing housing units. And I'm talking about single family housing, I'm talking about multifamily housing. All housing is good housing um, from, from at, at the macro level. It also looks at promoting greater fair housing choices, right? People should be able to live where they are most comfortable. They should have opportunities to live in other parts of town um, besides where where their their budget um, may may limit them to. And we see some of the um, subsidies that our programs can provide as a means of making that possible. And then finally, as I mentioned, um, overcoming pat um, patterns of, of, of segregation, right? Looking at, at how we can deconcentrate uh, poverty, how, how we can um, try to develop mixed income communities. So as we started, once we had our goals in place, we kind of understood what the problem was, then we needed some tools to figure out how we start to address the problem. And one of the primary tools that we latched on to was something called a market value analysis. And what the market value analysis did was it gave us a, a, real, a, a view, an evaluation of real estate conditions across the city, right? It, it helped us indicate where the strong markets were, where the weak markets were, where the um, real estate sales transactions were, were, were happening, where properties were not selling, where there were vacant properties, where there were foreclosures, where there were government subsidies concentrated. And using all of that information, it, it helped us come up with um, these colors here, right? And um, you've got some, was that nine or 10, 10 different colors that it, it used to, the market value analysis used to characterize the different parts of the city. Where the controversy comes in, right? Some folks think, oh, the controversy is around the MVA. MVA is just a measuring stick, right? If you don't like a, like a ruler, then don't use it, but it's, it's, it's just a measuring stick. Where the controversy comes in is around the selection of these areas, right? So. The, the, be, be, before I get into the areas, what, what the housing policy attempted to address was um, prioritizing 
where the city invests its resources. Right? The city has limited funds to invest. In previous years, the city used a um, scattered approach to investing, a little bit of money everywhere across the city. And what we found was that, uh, sorry, what, what, what was that uh, we weren't having the level of impact that we were looking for. So um, what the housing policy attempted to do was to concentrate investments in particular areas. And the controversy around, did we get it right? Did we select the appropriate areas to invest in? And you can be the judge of that. So um, the first group of areas that were selected in the housing policy for investments were what we call reinvestment areas, or excuse me, redevelopment areas. And the redevelopment areas are those areas that are already strong real estate markets um, where there are projects that are shovel ready to go and they're, they're in good position to provide um, affordable housing. Because oftentimes they're, they're high opportunity areas, you don't have to deal with um, those high concentrations of poverty and so on. The next group, which sort of fits in line with the, the, the gentrification theme of, of tonight's um, discussion is what we call stabilization areas. And these are markets that um, may be that are near to the redevelopment areas. And they're showing signs of displacement. So for example, there may be um, landlords who are realizing that property values are going up and there's an opportunity for them to cash in. So they're, uh, they're asking tenants to, to um, relocate so that they can sell the properties. Or they want to rehab their properties and increase rents and existing tenants can no longer afford the rents. And the big challenge for, for, for tenants in these areas is that when they move out of their, their current home, they can't, there aren't other options that they can afford in the neighborhood where they may have grown up, right? Where they may have lived for many years. The other scenario that you find in these um, stabilization areas is homeowners. You have homeowners that may have lived there for many years. They, they may not even have a mortgage on their home. But because um, builders are coming in, knocking down smaller homes, building up these really luxurious homes. Property values are going up, which means property taxes are going up. So these folks who are at the lower end of the income spectrum, even though they own their home, their own homes, they can't afford to keep their own homes because of those property taxes. So it's a lot cheaper for them to sell and move somewhere else where they can um, afford to live. So we're, so, so we're looking at how we can apply our investments to those areas. And then finally, you have the emerging markets. And the emerging markets um, are areas that have not been able to draw the level of interest from the private developers that's needed to uh, help them become stronger um, um, markets, right? These are areas that typically uh, lack the infrastructure that's needed to prepare land for, for housing development. These are areas that may struggle with um, some environmental issues, right? That may, may uh, be a concern for builders. They may have crime issues um, that folks may not want to live there because um, that still needs to be addressed. Dumping. Right, um, various issues of, of, of physical blight. So, so what we're looking to do in these areas is to invest in the infrastructure into a more targeted approach on um, code, in, code in enforcement, on um, crime protection, so that we can prepare the, the land for future development. So um, some of the programs, and I'm not going to have time to go through all of these slides, but some of, some of the programs that the housing policy outlines 
Um, we have a new construction and the substantial rehabilitation program, which deals with uh, the development of both single family and multifamily housing, typically about five units or more. But I would, tip, I would say it's larger scale developments that we would invest in. We also have a land bank program where the city works with um, the other taxing entities like the school district and the county and the uh, hospital district. And we agree that we will forego taxes on tax delinquent properties so that we can, can get those, we can sell those properties to developers and get them on back on the tax roll. And um, this, is, this has been a program that's been in effect I say since the, about 2004 or so. Um, we have tax increment financing districts, which are areas where new development is taking place and the, the, they are generating additional tax revenues that can be used to support um, affordable housing development. Right? We have a housing trust fund, which is, is something new in the housing policy that we're looking to um, to 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 generate um, cash in that will fund future development. I'll tell you there were a number of inactive um, TIFs, uh, tax increment financing districts, and we we the Office of Economic Development identified about seven million dollars that can be used to initiate this housing trust fund. Um, and that's something that the city council will be voting on, I want to say, in the next few weeks. Right. So, um, it's not there. Um, the other piece of it, okay. So we, we just, 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 sort of, oh, just to sort of finalize this, housing policy speaks to our um, home repair program, which has been redesigned to increase the amount of money that's available for uh, homeowners that meet our income guidelines um, to, to uh, receive some, some assistance. Um, we also have a home buyer program where we can help um, people who are in the market to purchase homes, um, acquire homes. And then this is a new program that we're looking to establish through the uh, Dallas Housing Finance Corporation sublease voucher program, where uh, we would subsidize um, landlords to incentivize them to uh, rent to, 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 to lower income families. Right? So I, I encourage you to check out the housing policy and um, get involved in the discussions um, where we are. Um, we have a housing task force that was established through the housing policy. And as the housing policy is revised over time, um, that will be one of the primary groups that weighs in on what, what it um, shapes up to be. So with that, um, thank you for your time.
uh, and a pencil extra if you need it to write questions. Uh, someone will come around and pick up the questions. If you will just hold the card up like this, somebody will come and get it and bring it up and uh, we will read questions as many as we can to, to our uh, panel and ask for their input. market segmentation when it comes to, well, it's not you guys' job, it's the appraisal industry, but I think there are some other ways to appraise property values that are a bit less predatory than what we see today in Dallas that Austin has implemented, well, the Travis County has been fairly, fairly uh, successful, but we'll get to that in a minute. This doesn't count in my 15 minutes. <laughs> so how do we measure affordability? We've talked about 30% income. Anything else that comes to your mind? Come on, class. No? All right. Well, let's talk about this 30%. Oh, yes, ma'am. No, I was just thinking, even, even um, you have to consider maintenance as well as, you know, if you're buying your home. Uh -huh. uh, not just the 30% that you may be paying for your mortgage. Mm -hmm. In my case, it's like 40 now since I've retired. My income has been reduced. So it's 40 to 45% just for the mortgage. So that leaves maintenance an issue, mm -hmm. you know, especially when you uh, become a senior and, like I said, retirement, you think, uh, All right, so we talked about income, this person, 30%, 40%. All right, 
Well, here's a study that was conducted by the National Low Income Housing Coalition, which is a big organization in the country. And what they have shown is that with a minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, you would have to work 86 hours to be able to afford in one bedroom, a modest one bedroom. 86 hours, y'all, right? That's a lot of hours. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, a week. A week? Yeah, right? So now, if you work, 40 hours a week at 7.25 an hour, then you can afford $377 a month. If you found that somewhere else. Right. Look me up, please. I have student loans. So this graph shows that rent is going up in Dallas, which is a surprise to no one, I'm sure. And this graph that was made by Greasy Workshop is showing that we're not building a lot of affordable housing, mainly higher end. Uh, housing, right? So you have a lot of different pressures coming from different fronts that is really exacerbating the issue of affordability. So now we've talked about, right, the 30% and David <laughs> has talked about it as well. Well, the rule of thumb is if you spend more than 30% of your income towards housing and utilities, then you're cost burden. Right? That's the rule of thumb. It's in your mortgage paperwork. It's about everywhere. <clears throat> now, where that comes from? Why 30%? Why a percentage? Why not a set value? Why, right? Well, done some research because that was my job a couple of months ago. This rule of thumb comes from the 19th century, so like 1800 something, right? So a long time ago. It was based on very primitive statistics. Two early German statisticians looked into consumption patterns of households, so they looked into how much people were spending towards lodging. And they were like, well, you know what? Since you're spending that much, then that's what you can afford. And that has produced throughout times, right? So we're still using that 30% income ratio, although there is no statistical basis to it. There is no conceptual basis. There is no theoretical basis. There is nothing solid that would justify why this rule of thumb is at heart of public policy in our country, dictating what we pay for and what we get and what's our quality of life, right? So what those uh, statisticians have proposed is this, is that the percentage of income that a household spends towards housing and utilities is invariably the same, whatever the income is which is what we see today, right? So now, we know that 30, if you spend more than 30% of your income towards housing and utilities, you're cost burden, right? Test, quiz, don't cheat. Case study number one, oh, I always dream to do that, y'all. John has an annual income of $500,000 a month. Now you know what, a year. He spends 31% of his income towards housing and utilities, okay? You have Elizabeth, who has an annual income of $9,000, and she spends 29% towards housing. Who is cause burden? Is it John? Is it Elizabeth? Is this fake news? <laughs> is John hiring? All right, who's cause burden? Someone spent 31%, someone else 29 Anybody want to answer that one? Extra credit? But it's 29%, what are we talking No. So what's wrong then? She's making too little. She's making $9,000. Well, she's definitely making too little. But I think that the metric that is at heart of who's cause burden and who's not, maybe is broken. Maybe it's not reflective of the quality of life of a lot of individuals in our communities, right? So all that to show you a few numbers here. So this table shows the propensity of certain households to be cause burden, to be spending more than 30%. Caveat that the metric is broken. It is very likely that the lower your income, the more uh, cost burden you are, obviously, right? So you probably don't have time to actually dive into the table, but what it shows is that renters are more, more cost burden than homeowners in Dallas, right? It's a disparity to acknowledge. On the other side, of course, households at the lower income, uh, the lower end of the income spectrum are also more cost burden than their counterpart, right? So if you are 30% AMI, so area median income, right? If you make 30% of the median income, you're more cost burden, or more likely to be cost burden than someone at 80, or 100, 110, and so forth, right? So we need to acknowledge those disparities because when it comes to writing policies and programs, we need to know where to prioritize resources, right? Hence, question number three. What factors affect affordability? We've talked about income. Expenses. Expenses, right? That's very good. The job, 
All right? So that, that has a lot to do with family positions, all right? What else? Medical. Taxes. Medical, all right? Yeah. Oh. All right, so like, okay, aside of paying for stuff, what else? things that we don't often talk about when it comes to affordability, right. which is location, geography, policies, of course, and place-based investment. Two maps here. The first one with the pink areas, those pink areas are neighborhoods that are racially and economically segregated. Yeah. Severely segregated. If you want, we can get into the methodology, but I only have 15 minutes, uh -huh. so I can't do that, but just trust my words. <laughs> so those areas, have been plagued with intergenerational poverty and economic segregation. Unfortunately, the landscape is pretty alarming, but this is the landscape that we know in Dallas, right? So you have those pockets of segregation. And here, this is the landscape. Oh, you can't really see the colors very well. But you have red and green. Red, what? 15 minutes? No. Oh. <laughs> I'm already in the light. OK, good. So pink areas are segregated neighborhoods economically and racially. This is a map of racial segregation, right? What it shows is the extent to which a neighborhood has more white residents than the city average, or more non-white residents than the city average. More white is red, more non-white is green. We have a pretty clear, almost surgical line dividing our city, right? And that's problematic. That's very problematic. So let's move forward. That's the landscape, right? But then you have families inside those beautiful maps that we put together, right? So it starts to, let's start to look into who lives in there. Are you guys familiar with the Housing Choice Voucher Program? The way it works is the federal government will come and give a voucher to your family and say, take it, you will live wherever you want, as long as you can pay for it, right? right. Now, source of income discrimination, anybody heard of it? Source of income discrimination. I know it's very fast and I have this very quick sense. Well, in Texas, the landlord gets to say no. If I come to your landlord and I have a voucher and I have enough money for the asking price, a passport, no background, and all that good stuff, he still gets to say, you know what? No. Yeah. State law, my friends. State law. So, anyway, those dots that you see are housing choice vouchers families in Dallas. Same here, just the same map, right? And what we have found is that those neediest, our neediest families, are living in the most segregated neighborhoods in our city, but also in our region. So talking about affordability and how policy and geography really affects your ability to afford housing, right? Those families have the means to access higher opportunity rich neighborhoods. But no, they are living in those segregated neighborhoods. I'm gonna to try to move very fast because I have much more. This map shows, let me back up. Inclusive Communities Project has conducted a survey of landlords either participating or not participating in the voucher program. So landlords saying, yeah, I want your voucher, and no, I don't want it. The dots that you see on this map shows the location of landlords refusing vouchers. And you would see that they are located in those red areas, in those predominantly white neighborhoods. Where your housing choice voucher is family live is all around them, right? So as you would intuitively think, we're not finding housing choice vouchers families where landlords are shooting them. Wow, shocking, right? But that's the landscape that we have to, to deal with. I'm not gonna get into that, that's a lot. Oh. So, you could all know uh, Dr. Carson. Not too long ago, we looked into, as a country, we looked into tripling the rents of a lot of uh, very poor families, right? And so I was interested from my personal research for the pursuit of my doctorate do you see where there are not families who are already receiving subsidy for housing, who are facing affordability issues, right? Because the discourse is, you know what? You're getting help from the government, you're good to go, go be someone. And so I wanted to see where there are not, you know what, the help that they're getting, is it sufficient to achieve self-sufficiency? She said no, I said no too, and I, that's what I found. So I looked into whether or not housing shows vouchers families have enough, had enough resources to afford transportation. <coughs> Right? Because you have to go somewhere, most likely, right? You have to take your kids to school, you have to go get a job, and all of that. So what I have done is I looked into affordability issues, right? Did I use the 30% income ratio? You bet I did not. 
because this rule doesn't hold. So what I have done is actually to use what is called a residual income approach. So it's pretty much doing what we just described, right? I took each family's income and I took off the price of childcare, healthcare, food, <sighs> hygiene, education, everything. And all those expenses were calibrated based on family composition. So if you were disabled, your healthcare costs were calibrated, if you have children and so forth, right? I took everything out of income but transportation. And what is left is what you can afford for transportation, right? And those were housing choice vouchers families in our region, so I had about 29,000 families. So it's a big sample. Here are the fine guys. I found that 75% of housing choice vouchers families, housing choice voucher families, cannot buy, maintain, and operate a car. Remember, remember where they live. They live in the most segregated neighborhoods in our city and in our region. 63% of them, let's say they already have a car, can they maintain and operate the car? Can they buy gas, registration, insurance? No, they can't. Unless they're gonna have to sacrifice healthcare, or even McDonald's, or they're gonna have to skip one of their basic expenditure. So then I translated their income left for transportation into public transit uh, equivalences. And so what I have found is that close to six out of 10 families are unable to afford transit, a monthly original transit pass. This is sad. This is alarming, this is bad. Then we have found that for all the adults, for half of your dependent, can you afford those transit pass? You still can't. Then you relax the assumption for one person in a household, 52% of housing choice vouchers families are still unable to buy one regional monthly transit pass. Do you guys know how much that costs, one pass? Yeah. How much? Oh, you're talking about monthly? Yeah, a monthly original transit pass, what's the cost? I think it's 100, it's 100. About $110, $110 somewhere around. Uh, it took me 45 somewhere around there, wouldn't it? It's $160. Yeah, $160. It's $160, right? To keep in mind. And then the daily pass is $6. Yeah, and you're going to ride And it's not even taken into consideration. So we're talking, can you actually financially access transportation? Knowing that you already have the burden of living in segregated, uh, low opportunity areas, right? This map, which is kind of complex to read, but you have a range of colors from blue to yellow. Blue is less jobs, yellow is much more jobs, right? And you would see that the darkest shades are in the southern sector of Dallas, in all these little areas where we have seen those pink areas that I showed the first map, right? This map shows the number of jobs accessible within a 30 minute transit commute. So not only do you live in a racially segregated, economically segregated, you don't have the financial needs, but transit doesn't get you to the same amount of jobs than if you were living in some other areas of the city. And this is just transit, all right? We're not even looking at private transportation. So this is very brief, you know, we've been conducting this research for two and a half years. There is a 400 page document that will be posted tomorrow or Monday on our website, which is the fair housing assessment for the city of Dallas and the region as a whole. But some of the big takeaways, and I'm almost done, I promise, I'm not, so 60 minutes, right? I'm 60 minutes. <laughs> so we have found a very stark geography of inequity. We also found uh, very growing disparities and inequities along racial lines. But the big takeaway, or I would like to leave you with, is to be careful with data being thrown at you. Always think critically, because 30% of your income is not the same for everyone, right? And when you know that the city is engaged, to hear about your concern about where to prioritize and who to prioritize for, then you have to be cognizant of what are some of the inequities. Who are the neediest of the neediest in our family? In our family? Hey, right? In, in our Dallas family, right? And so I think that um, this is mainly the, the last lesson that I want to give you guys. And I think this is it. No, this is not it. We have, of course, drafted goals and strategies to bridge the gap in fair housing, which I would invite you to discuss with me maybe afterwards, but it's on our website, and I think we'll read it up this time. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Now it's Sandy Rollins' turn. Sandy is the executive director of the Texas, uh, Texas Tenants Union and has been for many years. She is also a goal <coughs> line of information. And she's looking for her help. Yeah. <laughs> Relax. 
Did it just go to work? Uh, no, it didn't go to work. It just, uh, sure. Oh, yeah. That's going to be millennial through the technology. Uh, yeah. No big deal. Call a brand about it. Hey, I can pop a second. Okay, here we go. Here we go. This one? Yeah.
with uh, the uh, available units for extremely low income people. Only 19 uh, units affordable and available to every 100 extremely low income tenant households. Um, uh, the city, um, I'm going to dump on a little bit. Um, the, the, the comprehensive housing policy they came up with uh, found 20,000 units were, were lacking. Um, and uh, uh, so they, they have a goal of producing 20,000 more units in the next three years. Most of them are for home ownership. Um, and for those that are for rental, they are prioritizing at the higher end rather than the lower end. So let me just ask, um, you know, who here thinks, um, you know, two thousand dollars a month is is affordable? Anybody? Um, okay. Uh, how about how about uh, sixteen hundred a month? Um, yeah, I, I agree. Um, but the way the the city's comprehensive housing policy, um, uh, what, what they're doing with this is uh, twice as many units on the rental side for people that make 100% and 120% of the area median income, which is uh, $54,100 for, for one person at 100%, and $64,920 for one person at 120%. And of course, there's lots of housing being built that people that, at that income level can afford, right? I mean, you see the cranes all over the place. Um, and what, what, was, what was there before the crane was often an apartment complex that had lower rents. But what comes afterwards are luxury housing. And um, so, you know, what we don't see uh, what's considered uh, extremely low income, and there's still people that make less than this because we see them all the time, um, is uh, for one person at $16,250. That's just slightly over minimum wage. But still, there's a whole lot of people that have to survive on far less than that, and there is no development coming in that produces the rent that's affordable to them, which would be $406 a month if you assume that 30% of income is, is really affordable. And I think Miriam showed that it's not, and I certainly, you know, that's the standard that's been used forever and ever. Um, and again, if you make a half a million dollar a year, then sure, you know, you can pay 30% of your income and that's fine. But if you're making minimum wage, 30% of your income means, you know, something else is not going to get done. And, and if you're, um, you know, an uh, elderly person with $1,000 a month or $800 a month Social Security, uh, there is no place um, that people can afford to live. Uh, landlords expect you to make two and a half, three times the, the rent, and, you know, you don't even qualify to live here. So, so, uh, so I have some serious concerns about the city's affordable housing policy. Um, uh, the, the goal of having mixed income housing is fine, but there's a different way you could go about doing that. Um, uh, the other uh, city policy that's been in place for a long, long time are the tax increment financing districts. So that's what produced, uh, you know, the 13.9 million that Roger Staubach and his partner got to put up Cypress at Trinity Groves. And they have to set aside 20% of the units that they call affordable. I'm going to use air quotes because, you know, the, uh, you can, they can satisfy that with an efficiency unit that costs more than $1,000 a month. There were HMK tenants who didn't have $1,000 a month in income. So if you're going to put pressure on West Dallas um, and make it easy for, you know, the landlords out here to cash in for redevelopment, um, there needs to be something to stop the displacement and make room for people in this city. And that's what the city has not done. Um, uh, TIF district was in uptown. Um, most of most of the you know what's just north of downtown, which used to be the, the original Freedman's town, um, uh, State Thomas, um, an African American community adjacent to it was Little Mexico Village. TIF money went in, and it was just mass displacement. So. Um, 
but that's what some in the city consider to be success. And I think that's a failure on, on the part of this, the, the city government. And so um, there's, there's other TIP districts in West Dallas and Bishop Arts and Oak Cliff and um, in East Dallas and we're seeing the housing stock disappear. Um, <clears throat> I want to move on to uh, state tenant landlord law, which talked about, asked about, talk about tenants' rights. And most uh, uh, tenants' uh, rights come from uh, the state legislature. It's in the Texas Property Code. Texas is a, a very landlord-friendly state. Um, and it, is, it is easy to evict uh, in this state. I might need to get my water sorry. So in many states, um, in fact, in most states in this country, uh, if a tenant is uh, in violation, they have something called the opportunity to cure. Um, the, 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 the right to um, uh, three days to pay your rent and um, <coughs> three days to get rid of the dog or pay the pet deposit or even the state of Mississippi has the opportunity. Texas, even Mississippi. Even Mississippi. Um, the state of Texas does not. <coughs> now, I will say that um, for those of you who, who live in um, public housing or uh, tax credit properties, uh, you, you do actually have a few more rights than just in, in plain private housing in Texas. But in Texas, most people in apartments anyway sign the Texas Apartment Association lease. That allows for a 24-hour notice to vacate. Uh, that if you don't, if the tenant doesn't leave, and obviously leaving in 24 hours is pretty difficult. Um, the landlord can file with the Justice of the Peace Court for eviction. The court date comes up within 10 to 21 days. The tenant, if they lose, are given five days to move out or appeal. Um, there are no counterclaims in eviction cases in Texas. So no matter what your landlord has done wrong. Um, it can't be brought up uh, as a counterclaim in an eviction case. Um, there is no rent withholding or payment into escrow in, in Texas, no matter how bad the conditions are. So you can have raw sewage that flows down your, your hallway every time you flush, and uh, you can't withhold rent in this state. And as soon as you don't pay a full amount of rent you owe one time, that's grounds for eviction. Is that my time? Five more minutes? Okay. Anyway, so there's there's a lot that needs to be done to uh, bring Texas tenant landlord law into the 1970s. Um, uh, but besides besides rents not being, you know, there's no rent control, but um, aside from that, we are seeing landlords get more and more and more creative with the extra fees and, and charges that get tacked on. So we see mandatory pest control fees, which are never used for bed bug treatment. That's always something extra. The tenant always gets blamed for bed bugs and then they get sent a bill for the bed bugs. And they don't sell them. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, or the, yeah. Um, there's, there's mandatory valet trash pickup fees. Even if you don't want somebody picking up your trash, even if you can't afford to have somebody come pick up your trash. You've seen people with mandatory cable TV, even if they don't have a TV or a computer and don't want one. Um, there's administrative fees that get tacked onto utility bills. And so these aren't even included in the rent, but these are the kinds of things that are crushing people um, and making it very difficult to, to get to the end of the month. Um, we see uh, fines imposed by landlords where they'll um, uh, say, that there was one woman who, who was watching her 10-year-old child out the window on the playground and she got a $200 fine for having an unsupervised child and when she didn't pay it, um, the Texas Apartment Association lease has a clause that says, if you owe us any money uh, other than rent, we're going to take it off your rent first. And so they do that and then claim you still owe rent and therefore the late fees continue to accumulate. So the clock doesn't stop ticking. Um, so people will maybe pay rent in full, pay one day late, think that they you know, know that they owe the initial late fee. Um, but don't realize that, that the, the fees continue to accumulate. Um, landlords are using online rent payments um, now. Sometimes it's mandatory. That's the only way you can pay. Um, we see it at tax credit properties where they're uh, 
voucher holders that might not even have a bank account because they get their check and it, it, as soon as they cash it, it's gone. And so they don't have a bank account. It puts them in the position of having to get a prepaid debit card or use MoneyGram, which have a lot of fees associated with them too. Um, uh, the, the worst thing in the Texas Apartment Association lease, well, hard to say, but one of the worst things in the Apartment Association lease is a clause that says, we can evict you, we can, we can terminate your lease with a 30-day notice when we want to redevelop. And we've seen this happen in, uh, in Oak Lawn and, and, and other parts where, uh, you know, tenant signs a lease for a year. They think they're protected for a year. Uh, but Clause 26.5, which is buried in the middle of this very complicated um, fine print, reader unfriendly lease, says if we're, if we're going to demolish and not use it as rental housing for six months, all we have to do is give you a 30-day notice. It's five days in the event of a disaster. And so that happened to tenants in Houston who were still evacuated during Harvey. They, they, uh, we decided to shut down, come get your stuff. You've got five days. Um, so there's some extremely unfair provisions in that contract that make life very difficult for people. There are things um, the Texas legislature could do. Um, in the last session, uh, 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 State Senator Royce West introduced a bill that would have provided at least 120 day notice if tenants were asked to move for redevelopment. It would have called for no displacement of school aged children during the school year. It would have established a right of first purchase for tenants if who lived in a single family home or duplex if the property was for sale. That was Senate Bill 1202. It didn't pass. Um, Excuse me. Yeah, uh, 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 State, Senator, uh, State Representative Victoria Neabe introduced House Bill 3363 to provide advance notice on rent increases. Uh, we asked for at least a 30-day think time um, before the tenant would have to either sign a new contract or give notice that they were leaving. Um, it, uh, it, it got filed with a 14-day think time. It almost passed with a seven-day think time. Um, it got killed at the end of the session. It didn't pass. Um, but when, when you're, when, when, if you've been living someplace for a while and, and your landlord gives you the option of, well, you can, you can sign for a year and pay $150 more. You can sign for six months and pay $250 more. You can go month to month and pay $300 more. That's sticker shock. I mean, people can't. Um, they need time to figure out where am I going to go, you know, um, and, and do I have to stay and just uh, give up the rest of my life uh, and, and do nothing but pay all my rent to my landlord. Uh, there were bills filed to expunge eviction records on dismissed cases. Those didn't pass either. Um, but there's there's much more that needs to be done, and um, uh, this is something that state senators, state representatives need to hear from people. Well, good evening. My name is uh, Sherman Roberts, and I'm president of Citywide Community Development Corporation. And Citywide Community Development Corporation is a nonprofit uh, that is organized under federal rules. Uh, we work closely with the city of Dallas, and we have to be certified each year to receive some funding uh, from the, the citywide uh, from the city. Uh, we do affordable housing mainly, and some economic development housing. Uh, our mission is to provide affordable housing and economic development to help the area become revitalized and help the person become self-sufficient. And I'll cover past the statistics here. I'm and I'm going to be like Sandy. I don't want to dump on the city, but the housing policy uh, it has certain areas where you can develop in. And uh, of course, one of the areas that, now I won't say you can't develop in, but you don't get more incentives if you develop in those areas. But because I think with the policy, we want to do is spread housing out and give people choices. And that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because some people don't want to lose, leave their communities. 
And so they should have the same amenities in their area as well as in the other areas. So I work in the uh, Lancaster Quarter, the Lancaster area, and Oak Cliff, also uh, one of the other areas in Fair Park, South Dallas. These areas are excluded. And when these ex areas are excluded, you know what's happened. We talked about Uptown. We talked about uh, uh, Bishop Arch. And you know, you can see it. You can see it down the street here. And the gentleman just talked about it. You know, when you start doing these development, you also have to consider the people that's already living there and what you're going to do. I believe in mixed income. I believe in putting affordable housing and mixed income in the area that, I, that I'm working in and also doing an overlay so I can protect the people that's been in their houses for years and years and not have to move. I don't think you have to bust people out of a neighborhood in order for them to have quality housing because this is a whole city and every area should have it. So you can look at the areas in the southern sector, you can see that there's no sidewalks, no lighting, and so you're saying we have to pass a housing policy to do that, we shouldn't have to do that. It's policy, and, and I'm going to keep saying it, it's policy, and it's the political will of the politicians that sit around that table, reason why we're not doing it. So I applaud of the legal, legal women who, who bring these forms together, I applaud y'all who comes out, because we got to keep telling our politicians we have to spread the wealth throughout the whole city of Dallas and not bust people out like we did schools. And then when you do that, you're going to come gentrify. And these are more statistics. Uh, right now, average uh, studio apartment is $800. You know, the uh, one bedroom, 1060, two bedrooms, 1420, three bedrooms, 1990 and a four barrel 2600 and depending on where you go sometimes they are a little higher than that and so uh, it's hard to kind of you know make it on it when incomes are not going up these are some of the projects that we uh, do as affordable housing uh, these houses were donated housing during the crisis of, uh, of uh, uh, when the, the banks were going through it sometimes they get a lot of uh, donating of houses and we sold these houses at cost. Whatever the cost that we put into them, we sold them. Most of them went for 30, 35, or 40,000. We got a total of uh, 45 houses donated from the banks. So we passed that cost on to, to the buyer. So whatever we put in there, we sold the houses. You won't find a house that could cost over 45,000. Uh, this is a uh, assisted living, uh, well, this apartment complex that we did with the city of Dallas, 12 bedroom apartment complex for seniors with disability. Um, we, it's project based, so we, we have the vouchers and we work with the tenants on that, but it's for seniors 55 and older. These are the single family homes that we done, and these were some that we done with special funding that we got through the federal government, President Obama's American Recovery Act that was administered by the city of Dallas. And at the time, they was doing it for 50%, so all these houses we built these houses right here. These were based at 150,000. Most of them uh, appraised for 143,000. So half of those houses, half of that price went to the tenants. So they got about half of that in equity. So most of the houses sold at 75 and 80,000. Okay. And uh, this is a project right across the VA hospital. This is what's participation deal with the city of Dallas. Uh, they participated with some bond funds real big to try to do mixed income. And, and uh, so this is a, a project with the city, with HUD, and this is truly a mixed income developer because half of them are affordable for 80% and below, and the other half is from 80% up to 120. So it's, we did that. that's who I think you should mix up area and not say everybody got to move out. And we have people from downtown, from uptown, that moved in here because it was cheaper. And we have all races living in this apartment complex right now. And, and it's on a dark rail line, so what we try to do in our area, we try to build on a dark rail line. So if you don't have a car, at least you can save money from work there. And those are the kind of programs, I think, that we should try to integrate to make the city bring the money to the areas that's needed. This is a distressed area. So we shouldn't be trying to, and I'm not going to say 
give people choices where they can't move north or something like that, that's okay. But most people, like I say, want to stay in the area, you want to develop the area that they live in. Just a little slow. Uh, this is just uh, information on other projects that we've done that links to Keys Village, uh, where Rudy's is. This is an apartment complex we did right here by Rudy's. It's an apartment for homeless women with, with children. We uh, pull all the, the women that's living in the shelters, and so they apply for this project. It's a project-based project. You have to have kids to live in here, and it's just for women. Where are they located? Right there by Rudy's Chicken. Off of Lancaster and Keys. And this is the way I look inside. Services come with it. Educational services. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, we try to help them get into school, uh, into services. We audit by the state and see what services. Before you build a project, this is a tax credit project, you have to check off what services you're going to provide for the tenants. We also try to do community uh, services. So we do things like uh, uh, some some of the nonprofits, and I'm not one. It's two of my colleagues here now. They do other kinds of things, but like uh, uh, after school programs. But we do economic development. We wanted the uh, office building in the area because people want to stay in the area. They do you have businesses that's there that want to stay in the area? And this is on the side of Rudy. Is if y'all familiar with that? And like to get everything is Rudy. Uh, yeah, this is on the same side as Rudy's. Uh, Rudy's is here in the apartment. That office building is right on the side. Apartment's right behind. <laughs> now that that vacant lot there, uh, we got to talk about the city. We have an option to do some more community development on that too. We we do. And this is a proposed development that we uh, was invested in with the city to buy the land. This is a project to to be. This is the Lancaster Oak project. No. I'm just going to look at you so we can go up. <laughs> 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 oh, <my God. laughs> I'm not doing this. It, it just, you know. And I just showed you the Lancaster Oak Village. This is the project that we're proposing right now. It's 68 units. It's been, these, these are projects that I'm showing you in the future. Uh, behind that other project that was mixed, this is single family lodge that we have been accumulating. This is a total of 35 lots behind the Lancaster Urban Village. We already purchased the land for it. Uh, and this is uh, this the way the lots lay out right here. And that's for single family homes. Those are right there. It, because we're trying to do a mixed income, they'll start at 150 and go all the way up to 200. Could you go back one more site? The next one. That one. That one is a proposed development. We didn't done um, a lot of work on this one. This is the Lancaster Opal project. Uh, we've been meeting with a developer on this one. We do, we're redoing the architecture drawings now as we speak. We have another architect that's looking at it because we can't get, I think it's two lots that we're trying to get, so we might have to build around the homeowner. Yeah, well, okay, because I was, I was in, um, I was supposed to get a transfer and I don't know when, but I was going to Yeah. You have to have children. Oh, okay. 
And this is a, a latest project that we're proposing right now. We're working with the state, and hopefully with the city. This is 120 lodge for, for sale lodge. And this one is some NSP money, which uh, David here is an expert on that because he kept right the program. And in this one, the state has, uh, uh, we have to sell 25% of the houses and people at 50% and below the medium income. So that's going to be a tough sale, but the state is already working with us. But that's an opportunity for people to buy houses. And we can't just say all the 50% here, all the 80 and everybody else over here, we've got to mix them in. And so the state has already told us they'll work with us and bring mortgages for the people at 50%. So, uh, and uh, this is, David covered this, I want to cover this before I end. Um, these are the re redevelopment areas, and I'll fall into uh, the, uh, the, let's see, the area of emerging markets, which is the Lancaster Quarter. So you can see we have to do some studying before we can continue to build in that area. And that's why I'm really not crazy about the housing policy because it says I can't continue to build. As you can see, we already got momentum going, and so we want to keep that momentum going. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, now we have Janet Ahmed. Janet is from San Antonio, and um, she has a nonprofit that works on home construction fraud.
Um, that's not well documented. The, uh, the, it, a little bit of history might help you, help, help you understand how we've gotten to here. The one of the business, uh, business of doing a lot of bad things. And history is important. 1985, I don't know if you remember, I bet a lot of you do remember the SNLs disappeared. Yes. Old mortgage fraud. Well, wasn't well, very long thereafter that they decided, oh, well, that kind of worked, didn't it? Who went to prison? You know anybody who went to prison? I don't think so. They began changing the rules and the regulations and planning the next mortgage fraud. Um, the National Association of Home Builders. Um, in 1990, they were laying the plans for it. Uh, in, and uh, the, to plan their next housing bubble, as they called it. And they were targeting minorities in their, their sales pitch, so to speak. Henry Cisneros, our mayor of San Antonio, uh, was a very good mayor. He did a lot of good things for the city, very personable. And if he was here tonight, he'd probably go on the hug. <laughs> but I've been a thorn in his side. The, uh, Henry Cisneros decided that, uh, or was convinced that uh, he needed to deregulate the home building industry. So when he went to Washington as the Secretary of HUD, the 24 CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, states something very important. Any property that does not comply with the Code of Federal Regulations is ineligible for that funding. The home builders were in charge. They simply had to say, I promise I'll build it right on the form. And they falsified them. Hundreds of thousands of them were falsified. Um, the, uh, the plan itself was simple. The HUD uh, would, uh, the, the, uh, the, the National Association of Home Builders and its members began the HUD deregulation mortgage fraud plans for the low income housing boom. And they targeted minorities. They targeted blacks, Hispanics, they all, they, were, they, they called what they called uh, uh, targeting them into certain communities. I don't know if you remember, but there's one where they had bombs that they didn't mitigate. Now you might remember it. They, it's been on 2020, it was a big deal. They built on top of them, they knew they were there, and yet they built on them anyway. Now that wasn't mitigated because a dog brought some of them in and the children brought some of them in playing outside. They didn't mitigate all of it even after they found out it. They let them build 6,600 houses prior to the point where they found families found out about it and hit the news, then, they, then the city let them build 600 more houses on top of those bombs that were not mitigated. The, code of the, uh, the Corps of Engineers has the duty, they can't tell the builder to clean it up, it's the Corps of Engineers that has to clean it up. That's your tax dollars and mine. It cost them, I think it was 3.8 million dollars. They could not mitigate the ones under the sidewalks. They couldn't mitigate them under the streets. They couldn't mitigate them under the houses. But they found lots of bombs and some were alive. It was an old train, a, a military bombing range. But they also put certain, some people right on the target of the area. The salespeople would target them over to the target site. Other ethnic people were targeted over here. The white people, I believe, would probably be over here a little further away. This comes word of mouth directly from someone who worked there. That's the kind of thing we don't want to hear about, but it happened. The mortgage crisis is going to continue. It's going to happen again because they're now still selling houses with no money down 
and they're saying we can help the minorities. It doesn't help the minorities. It doesn't help because what do they? Anybody lose their home and are now in Section 8 housing? Uh, those houses then are then fixed up. One good example is Munisol in San Antonio, Texas. They spent $49 million uh, and HUD. HUD gave $49 million. They built houses that didn't have back door or back windows in the bedrooms or the or the end of the hall to the backyard. It wasn't so much that little Johnny didn't want to go out and play in the, you know, they didn't want to go out and play in the yard. What happens if something happens in the kitchen or there's a fire and it's a hazard. Those houses, because we went to city council and we raised cane, they got attention. And that's purely the, in the media. I can't tell you how much the media could do. I could fill this screen over and over and over with the houses and the problems with them. And the children that all had the same medication because those houses were making them sick. They would come home healthy from the hospital and the next week they would be on uh, CPAP machines. They all had the same medication. What did we do? We took them to city hall. And we used our voices. And the children stood before the counters and they said, this is my medication for this. This is my medication for that. What did we find? What, did, what happened? We got them out of those houses. That was not an easy job to do. We got them relocated. Uh, got them relocated at $3,000 a month for one family in hotels. Now that was had a discussion about whether it's affordable housing, affordable at what price when you get a bad house, when your children get sick for various reasons. First, uh, they promoted this, not only using the minorities, which bothered me very deeply, um, but they promoted low-income housing first, and then they changed it to make it a little bit more inclusive of all. And it went to uh, starter housing, starter homes. Then they changed the name to affordable housing. They started with the low income, and they graduated this up until they got to promoting these big mansions. We call it 200,000, 300,000, and it brought Dallas up into very high levels that you could get loans with no money down. Three and four hundred thousand dollar houses. San Antonio had three hundred four, three hundred four, three hundred and four hundred thousand dollar homes with no money down. That doesn't work. So get involved. That's the best thing I can tell you. Uh, you need to hold your elected officials accountable. Remember, they the the home builders not only get involved in the city council, but they get involved in your schools. They are now into the school business. You have to have schools to sell the houses out there on Farmer Jones or Farmer Brown's uh, ranch. Uh, and so they choose the lot area and they work with the school district. They get people elected there and they get the people that they want there. And those people go then to the city council after they've gotten their training there at the school board, and now they go to the city council and say, look, we're going to be developing over here. We want to work with your development services department. And Farmer Jones and Farmer, Farmer Brown sitting there saying, what, what development services department? Uh, uh, well, don't worry about that. We're going to help you build that development services and we'll show you how it works and you want to have some bonds in this they say to the school board we know you've got only two streets that are really in bad shape and you've got one traffic light well if we start start uh, promoting bonds and helping you understand how we can bring this free money into you we can even pay those streets with gold 
Yeah. Buy our houses. We're going to bring the teachers into it. And they take the food to them, to their lounge for lunch. Uh, bring the donuts in the morning. That's what literally happens. We know. But, but it's, it's complex. And I'm sorry if I if I make to show you any visual, but I hope that I, I came across it's not that we're bitter, it is factual. And you must get involved in your community. And I'm so glad that you came out here and, and did what you needed to, to, to do to learn what's going on, what's really going on. You've got to get it right because it's a never ending thing of um, affordable housing and what price? Children being sick, houses falling apart, weeds growing up under the plate of the walls into the, the living room. It, it, it's, it's, and then the, the plumbing, plumbing flow. Then the mold starts. So you've heard it all, you've seen it on TV, and we work very hard to get the word out. Go to hodb.org, that's our website. And you'll see a lot of our work um, that we've done. And uh, that's our presentation instead of a PowerPoint. But uh, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it.